Well, good evening, Faith Family, and welcome to our Sunday night service here at Faith Family Church of God. We are so glad you're joining in with us this evening. If you've not already done so, please like and comment down below to let us know that you're joining with us and share this on your feed so that we can get the Word of God out to others around us. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button and then click the bell for notifications when we go live and post new content. There's always something awesome happening at Faith Family Church of God, and we never want you to miss out. So make sure to click that subscribe button and then click the bell for notifications. All right, before we go into our word tonight, let's have our word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for this day, God. We thank you, God, for just the way that you're moving in our lives, God, and in our families, God, the way that you're moving mountains, Lord God, where you've brought us from, God, where you're taking us to, Lord Jesus, for your promises that are yes and amen, promises of provision over us every day and protection over us every day, that you are everything that we need. We thank you and we give you glory, honor, and praise, God, for everything you've done, are doing, and will do in Jesus' name. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, lifting up each need, God. You know the needs that we've been praying over on Monday nights and, on, and in Sunday services. Lord, you know the needs spoken and unspoken as well, the needs that are just present in the heart and the mind, Lord God. Meet each need according to your will and for your glory, God, whether it is spiritual uplifting or physical healing in bodies, God, financial blessings, God, our blessings in homes and marriages, Lord Jesus, draw them closer together in you, Lord God, and together as a family in Jesus' name. Those who need a blessing on their jobs, God, lead and guide their every direction and every decision, Lord God, and just use them for your glory, give them supernatural favor with everybody on their job, including their co-workers, their boss, their managers, everybody. Lord, and those who need a, a blessing in school, Lord God, help them to excel wonderfully, Lord, in school in every way. Whatever the need is, God, we lift it up to you, the author and the finisher of our faith, believing together for each need to be met according to your will and for your glory, God. And right now, in the name of Jesus, we come before you as well, Lord God, for this word tonight. Lord, just have your way in the service tonight. Use me for your glory as your messenger, Lord God. Pour out of me into others, Lord Jesus. Lord, let your word go out into every spirit here, every soul tonight, Lord God, that it shall not return void. God, we declare it in Jesus' name. We declare that word, that it shall accomplish everything that you have set forth for it to do right now, Lord, and in the moments to come and in the days to come. In Jesus' name, Lord, and we give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise, God. We just have your way, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, Amen and amen. Well, again, everybody, welcome to Sunday Night Service here at Faith Family Church of God in Pearl, Mississippi. We are glad you're joining in with us. So if you've been watching the last couple of Sundays um, on the in the night services, me and Sister Brenda, we have been going through the book of Hebrews. And last week, Sister Brenda talked about Hebrews chapter 5. She reminded us that priests are like ministers, pastors, preachers, those called by God, but they are people just like everyone else in the world, okay? If we're, you know, us teachers and preachers, ministers, whatever you want to call us, we are people just like everybody else in the world. She also reminded us that ministers can have compassion on others and try to so hard reach others because they understand what it is to be human and to be under pressure like everyone else, because we are all human, and we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are in need of a Savior. Just because somebody's a pastor or a minister doesn't mean that they don't have their shortcomings, because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are in need of a Savior. Amen. She also reminded us that the sacrifice of Jesus is for everyone, including ministers, and then she reminded us that Jesus is our high priest as he faced suffering, temptation, and many emotions that we would face. And then he died on the cross shedding his perfect blood for the forgiveness of yours and my sin. And he is at the right hand of God the Father making constant intercession for us evermore. Okay? And then she reminded us that so many people tend to get focused on other things to the point that they lose their spiritual edge and the basic truths are not thought of or even sometimes forgotten completely. We need to seek to grow in faith 
grow in his word and teach others how to grow in faith and to recognize right and wrong. This was a recap of what Sister Brenda talked to us about last week in Hebrews chapter 5. So tonight we're going to go through Hebrews chapter 6. And if I had to give tonight's sermon a title, it would be called Staying Anchored in Jesus. Staying Anchored in Jesus. Let's read the word. Hebrews chapter 6 says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it's cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love, which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So let's break it down. Here in chapter 6, in the beginning, the author transitions from one topic to the next. He switches from the principles and attributes of Jesus and urges the reader to then take the basics of Christianity, the salvation of Jesus Christ, and build upon that, pressing on to perfection, meaning to mature in Christ. See, if we want to grow in God, we have to be willing to go deeper into God's word and his presence every day. There is more to a relationship with Jesus and God than what's on the surface. There's more to a relationship with God than just repenting and asking for forgiveness to obtain salvation through Jesus, although that is the most important part because without the blood of Jesus covering us, we cannot make it. See, once we're saved, we have to want to grow in God and in Jesus. Because if there is no growth or movement, then everything stagnates or dies. And that is true for our spiritual being as well. It takes dedication on our part to study God's word, to pray every day and ask for revelation from God, ask for guidance from God and asking him to draw us closer to him every day. And the verse, it says, not laying down again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God or the doctrine of baptisms of laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. Let's break that down. 
Repentance from dead works refers to a change of mind about the demands of the law of Moses. Even though the law was good, it was weak because of the weakness of our sinful nature. We are reminded that what is needed for salvation is not lifeless works that cannot save, but faith directed toward God. It's not by works, lest any man should boast, but it is by faith alone that we obtain salvation. The doctrine of baptisms refers to either the previous baptism of the New Testament, such as Jesus, John the Baptist, and other believers, or to various ritual washings, cleansing rituals practiced by the Jewish people. And remember how we believe that baptism is an outward sign of an inward experience with God. It's saying that you are a changed person. You've been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb of God. And when you come up out of the water, you're signifying to the world that you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. The old you is dead and gone and you are a new creation. The doctrine of laying on of hands. In the book of Acts, the laying on of hands was used to impart the Holy Spirit to do the work of God within the person with whom it is being laid hands on. It was also used for ordination of ministry. The practice of this is also found in the Old Testament in commissioning someone to a public office or in the context of presenting a sacrificial offering to the Lord. The doctrine of the resurrection of the dead refers to the resurrection of all people at the end times. This resurrection is an Old Testament preaching or teaching that which is widely taught in the first century Judaism, especially by the Pharisees. To Christians, belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus is essential, for without his resurrection there is no forgiveness of sin. Excuse me. Next, you have the doctrine of eternal judgment. This refers to the belief that everyone will be judged by the great judge. The scriptures indicate that there are two judgments, one for believers in which Jesus determines every believer's reward, and then, of course, the judgment or condemnation of unbelievers. The author is reminding his audience here that coming out of Judaism, there was sure to be a temptation for a Jewish Christian to slip back into their old ways because it was what they used to know and what they are familiar with. And the author is reminding his audience that they need to be careful not to slip back into their old practices, which depends upon the law, the religious standards for salvation. Because look, even though Jesus came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, he even said, I came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. But by Jesus shedding his blood, dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, Jesus is now the only way to salvation from sin, and therefore the only way to God and to heaven. So the author is reminding the readers that they need to be careful, just don't slip back into their old ways. Because if they slipped back into their old ways and they believed that they had to do this and that to be saved, and not just believe on Jesus Christ, they would essentially be saying that Jesus is not enough for the forgiveness of our sins and for every everyday Christian life. But Jesus is enough. Amen? Say that with me. Jesus is enough. He's enough. Next it says, And this we will do if God permits. This expresses our complete dependence on God as believers and as children of God. If we do press on to maturity, it is because God helps us to press on. Because without God, we could do nothing. But remember, it also takes effort on our parts. Because God is always willing and he wants us to draw closer to him, but he is not going to force us. God is a gentleman. He's not going to force us into something that we don't want. Verses 4 through 6. It says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. 
This passage concerning the falling away of some from the faith has been interpreted many ways. Some insist that the author of Hebrews is speaking to those who heard the truth and appeared to believe in Jesus, but eventually demonstrated their shallow adherence to Jesus by publicly renouncing him. Others view these verses as a hypothetical argument. In other words, the author of Hebrews is using this hypothetical case to warn of the spiritually immature not to reject God's offer of salvation. Typically, those who hold these two views quote numerous passages that speak of a true believer's eternal security. They say that once God has saved us, nothing can separate us from his love. In other words, it's the famous saying, once saved, always saved. But there are others who insist that the author is speaking of genuine Christians who renounce Jesus they claim that this is a clear reading of this text and cite the numerous warnings in the New Testament to resist the deceptions of false teachers in support of their view. And see, guys, although nothing can separate us from God's love, because, yes, God does love us, even though nothing can separate us from his love, sin does separate us from God because sin cannot be in the presence of God. So, yes, Jesus loves us. God loves us no matter what. But with sin in our lives, we still, we fall away from God. We come out of the presence of God because we, uh, sin cannot be in the presence of God. So we have to repent. So if we come to the knowledge and the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we become fully aware of the truth that Jesus is Savior and if we accept him as Lord and Savior of our lives, if we sin, we must repent of our sins and ask for forgiveness from Jesus as sin, again, cannot be in the presence of God. Therefore, sin separates us from God. And Hebrews 10 and 26 even says, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So if we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior of our hearts and lives and we continue to willingly live in sin, it's not just messing up, but we continue to do the things that we've been doing, knowing they're wrong. We continue to live in sin and live however we please, even if it goes against God's word and his standards. If we basically trample over God's grace, using salvation and grace as an excuse to do whatever, or if we willingly turn our backs on God and go the other way, renouncing Jesus as Lord and Savior, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins because we are going against everything that God and Jesus stands for. For those who willingly turn their backs on Jesus and renounce their faith going another way, Again, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins because Jesus is the only way to God and the only way to heaven. So if you renounce Jesus and walk away, you're walking away from the only avenue, the only true avenue into heaven. There is no other way. And Hebrews 6.6 6 says, if it uh, even goes further to say that they fall away to renew them again to repentance as they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So there is no way, it says. In other words, departing from the faith amounts to a fresh public rejection of Jesus, a crucifixion of him all over again. But if we're trying our best to live for God and we accidentally sin and then repent, asking for forgiveness then God is merciful and just to forgive us of our sins and help us to pick up where we left off with him. Amen. So to help avoid falling away, or as we know it, backsliding, the author of Hebrews gives us a clear warning not to renounce Jesus or to reject his offer of salvation. Only those who believe in Jesus will be saved. And the day to embrace his gift, church, the gift of salvation, is today. Remember what we said before. Today is every moment because one moment has passed away. Once one moment has passed, the moment is no more. So the next moment is today. 
Therefore, every moment is the time for salvation, but we best not wait to repent and accept Jesus because there is coming a day when it will be too late to make a change. And wherever our spirit lies in relation to God and Jesus will determine where we spend eternity forevermore. Verses 7 and 8 says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Here the author tells a parable relating to agriculture to illustrate the spiritual truths conveyed in the previous verses. If we take in the word of God and accept God's standards and teachings, and listen for the voice of God following him, following after him every day, then we will grow and be blessed by God, and we will show forth the characteristics of God and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. However, if we hear the word of God and we feel the unctioning of God, but yet refuse him time and time again, then we are disqualified from eternity in heaven because only the blood of Jesus can get us into heaven. And if we die in sin, having refused Jesus as Lord and Savior, not truly accepting him into our hearts and truly repenting of our sins, then we face eternity in flames and in the darkness of hell. Verse 9 says, But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. With the warmth of the title, Beloved, the author assures the Hebrews that he is confident of better things for them. Their good works were signs to the author that they had genuinely received Christ and that they would look forward to growth and greater things in God. But the writer was let the audience know that the first part of this chapter was to warn them of the spiritual danger, not so much of because of rebellion, but because of the discouragement and because of the opposition that they may have been facing. Verse 10 says, For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Here we are reminded that God is faithful, church. He does not forget our love for him and the works we have done for his kingdom. And God is faithful to forgive us of our sins when we ask for forgiveness and live a life pleasing and glorifying unto him. Verses 11 and 12 says, And we desire that each of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through the faith and patience inherit the promises. And here, the author tells the Hebrews that he desires that each one of us would seek after God with all our hearts, with all our energy, and that they would not grow weary. We would not grow weary or lose heart nor live half-heartedly for God and not be losing their faith in God, but stay strong in their faith in God until the day when we're called home. Verses 13 through 15 says, For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And also, and so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. The author is encouraging the Hebrews here to press on in the faith and in growing in God. As followers of Jesus, we must continue to believe and continue to press deeper into God, doing kingdom work for his glory. Amen. Abraham is one of the earliest examples of faith and patience in God's promise. Although Abraham was not perfect, As none of us are perfect, Abraham waited 25 years from the promise that was first made until Isaac, the promised son, was born. And when God told Abraham to take Isaac up on the mountain to offer him up as a sacrifice to God, Abraham did just that. He took Isaac up the mountain. When Isaac asked his dad, where is the sacrifice? Abraham replied, God will provide the sacrifice. Then when they got up to the top, Abraham bound Isaac and placed him atop the altar, and when he readied the blade to sacrifice his son, as he was about to strike him, the hand of God stopped him and directed his attention 
to the bush nearby where God had provided a ram for sacrifice. Because of Abraham's faith and obedience to God, God provided miracles and blessings, and God honored his promise to Abraham to make him the father of many nations. What a man of faith. Verses 16 through 20 says, For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So the Lord confirmed his oath to Abraham by swearing or promising on himself, because he alone is beyond deceit. And Abraham's trust in God and his promise was the gateway to the fulfillment of the promise. And here are the two things that will never change throughout time are God's word and God's oath. So since God does not lie and since he is all powerful, he will fulfill all of his promises. And because God does not lie and because God keeps his promises... We can have comfort and be encouraged and our soul can be anchored in peace as we run to Jesus for peace, provision, protection, and rest, knowing that our hope in Jesus Christ is secure. And this hope and anchor for our soul is not going to fade away or expire because it is anchored in the very presence and the promise of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And because Jesus died on that cross, shedding his blood for the forgiveness of our sins, he has become our intercessor, our forerunner for us, going before God and making constant intercession for us throughout every situation of our lives, making a way even when there seems to be no way in certain situations and paving the way in eternity for us if we just follow him and more and seek more of him every day. And Jesus is our forerunner, just like a boat known as the forerunner, which is a smaller boat that goes into port when the weather doesn't permit the larger ship from entering the port. The forerunner goes into the port, carrying the anchor of the larger boat, and pulls, drops anchor in the harbor, securing the larger ship. Just like the smaller boat that goes into port to help secure the larger boat, Jesus is our forerunner and our anchor who has gone into port and he has laid down his anchor as he took on our sins, hung on that cross, shed his perfect godly blood for you and for me, dying on that cross, rising from the grave on the third day, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Because of Jesus being our forerunner, when we ask him into our hearts and believe with everything in us that he is the Savior and God, our soul is anchored in his saving grace. And as long as we keep our eyes focused on him, and as long as we don't sever the connection by going against the will of God and willfully sinning against him, then he will keep us anchored and steady in him during the stormy trials of life and guide us in the safe harbor of heaven one day when our souls can rest on in eternity. It's like the song, The Anchor Holds. Does everybody remember that song? It says, The anchor holds Though the ship is battered The anchor holds Though the sails are torn I have fallen on my knees as I have faced life's raging seas, but the anchor holds in spite of the storm. Jesus is our anchor. Amen. He is our grounding. He is everything that we have need of. He is our foundation. No matter what the devil brings your way, 
as we close, no matter what you face, stay anchored in Jesus. Don't let go. Don't let go, because if you let go, the storms of life may drag you down into the deep or drag you far back out to sea. And if we die in the sea of sin, not having our souls anchored in Jesus, then we won't be able to enter the safe haven of heaven to be with God and Jesus for eternity. Just stay anchored, church. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Stay in worship. Stay in God. Keep your eyes on Jesus and spend time again in prayer and in his word every day. Stay anchored. I'm going to say that one last time. Stay anchored no matter what's coming in your life, no matter what you've faced, no matter what you're going through right now. Stay anchored, church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that you've given us tonight, God, that we need to stay anchored in you no matter what, God, to keep our eyes focused on you, God, and stay anchored in you, God, no matter what comes our way. Help us, God, to never waver, Lord God. Just draw us closer to you, Lord, and just that we can seek more of you every day. Give us a hunger and a thirst for you more every day, God, and just draw us closer to you, God, and endear us to you. God, that we would resolve to keep our eyes focused on you and not on this world, nor the things that are of the world, Lord God. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. We are just voyagers passing through, um, passing into our home of eternity. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you so that we will not lose sight of eternity. We won't lose sight of you, God, and so that we can make it to heaven one day when this body passes away and the soul moves on into eternity, God. Help us to stay anchored and stay focused on you, God, no matter what. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. We give you glory, honor, and praise for it all. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen and amen. All right, guys, don't forget that tomorrow night, which is Monday night, um, is prayer. So, you know, comment those needs down and we will uh, pray over those. And just, you know, you spend time in prayer and we will all pray over those together. Um, so Monday night, we normally do it at 6, um, six o'clock. So make sure to tune in. And we will go over those and pray together. So send those requests in to us so that we can pray together. And Tuesday night at 6.30 is our youth lesson. I will be bringing the word Tuesday night. So don't forget to tune in at 6.30 on Tuesday night for our youth lesson. And then Wednesday night is Bible study with pastor at 6.30. So again, Monday night for prayer at 6 online. Tuesday night, 6.30 online for the youth word. Wednesday night, 6.30 for the Bible study. Love you all. Have an awesome weekend. God bless. And walk anchored in Jesus. Amen.